Well, in the um, sixth chapter of Mark's Gospel, we find the account of Jesus sending his disciples out on mission. They're going to preach, they're going to heal. But the first thing he tells them is, you have authority over unclean spirits. When they return from mission, the first thing they tell him is, we cast out many demons in your name. Now, when I was coming of age, I mean, even in the seminary, that kind of language was seen as, oh, kind of primitive superstition, talking about devils, demons. Or maybe we tried to put a sort of literary spin on it. It was a, a symbol for um, evil. It was a personification of evil in the personal or institutional sense. But here's the thing. That approach just doesn't do justice to the Bible. The Bible knows all about personal sin. It's very clear about that. It also knows about institutional disorder and dysfunction, very clearly. But it knows about a third level, a third dimension, a type of evil that is underneath, if you want, that undergirds the other two, is more pervasive and dangerous. This level of truly spiritual evil. I'm talking about fallen angels. Now, you know, Catholics get up every single week and we confess our belief in God who made the visible world and the invisible world. It means a realm of spirits, realities at a higher pitch of existence. What's a devil but a fallen or morally compromised angel? They're good and bad human beings. They're good and bad angels. But see, here's the thing. Think of a wicked person you know who's also very smart, very talented, and well-connected. That's a truly dangerous figure, right? When you combine wickedness with lots of other uh, powers. So, a devil, an angel, a being at a very high pitch of intelligence and so on, who has gone bad, is a dangerous figure indeed. Now, do devils influence the world sometimes in very direct and frightening ways? Yeah. Talk to anyone involved in uh, exorcism. I've talked to a few over the years, and... Uh, some extraordinary stories ensue. But that's not the typical way that the dark uh, realm intervenes. Usually it does so in a much more indirect way, by suggestion, by um, temptation. Something I featured in the Catholicism series, I think the most frightening religious painting in the world, at the Orvieto Cathedral, by the great uh, early Renaissance master Luca Signorelli, much admired by Michelangelo, by the way. But you see these frescoes there, and the, the most striking one is a depiction of the Antichrist. It shows this figure, the Antichrist, and he's listening as the devil whispers in his ear, so kind of a classic symbol of, of this temptation. But what's really interesting is the devil puts his hand kind of in the vesture of the Antichrist in such a way that it looks for all the world like the Antichrist's own arm. And it's a very clever way of suggesting how the dark powers influence us indirectly, clandestinely, by insinuation in such a way that, heck, it looks like our activity. And in many ways it is, but yet it's the dark powers having um, invaded. Now, what, what are the signs of the demonic? What are the ways the demonic appears? Well, look at the names the Bible gives. The devil is called, in the Greek, diabolos. Our word devil, uh, uh, diablo in, in Spanish, le diable in French, all come from that. Teufel in German, too. Um, Diabalain means to cast apart, to throw apart, to scatter. The great sign of the demonic is scattering. God is a great gathering force. Whenever things come together, when a community forms, that's a sign of the Holy Spirit. The scattering power that's a sign of the darker powers. When families get scattered, when uh, business organizations, when communities, when cultures get divided, that's the dark power. The other great name in the Bible is Hosatanas. That's the Greek that's based on the, on the Hebrew word that means the accuser. The accuser. Here's a little um, experiment. Try this uh, today. Examine your conscience and find out how many times in the course of the day you accuse someone. Of something. I bet you'd be kind of surprised. We do it a lot. It's, it's one of our favorite indoor pastimes. Point the finger, blame, uh, gossip, uh, destroy someone's uh, character. You know, The sign of the demonic is accusation. 
the Holy Spirit lifts up and confirms, you know, and, and affirms someone in his or her personhood. The demonic is the accusing power. Here's a related title I find fascinating. The Bible calls the devil the father of lies. God is truth. See, in truthfulness about ourselves, about our relationships, about our family, about whatever it is, truthfulness is always the path of light. It's the path that leads to smooth functioning, truthfulness. The sign of a demonic is deceitfulness, is untruth. Think now of the way an untruth about you has perhaps wounded you in a very deep way. Someone said something about you that wasn't true, it was a lie, but yet it wounded you in such a way that that wound is still festering after many decades. Think of the times you've wounded somebody with an untruth, you know? And again, the, the wrecking of someone's reputation, wrecking of someone's character by means of a lie, that's a sign of the, the dark power. Here's the last one, and it is the most frightening name. It's in the first letter of John. The author refers to the devil as the murderer from the beginning. God is, is life, right? God is life. Whatever enhances life is of the Holy Spirit. That's why John Paul talked about the culture of death, you know? The sign of the dark power is always an increase in death. It's a negation of life. You know, look at the 20th century, uh, which is the bloodiest on record. There's no question about that. The number of people killed, you know, for ideological purposes in warfare in the 20th century was the, was the worst ever. Can you explain that entirely through psychological or political categories? I mean, it just seems almost comically inadequate to the reality to say that you know, Hitler, Stalin, Mao, et cetera, are simply explicable politically or psychologically. I don't know. There's something about the, the pervasiveness of violence and, and the destruction of life in the 20th century that has all the marks of the murderer from the beginning. You know. Okay. Now, so far, that's the bad news, if you want. Here's the good news. The good news is, and it's central to Christianity, is that Christ has conquered these powers. He's conquered individual sin, true. He's conquered collective institutional sin. But the Bible clearly witnesses to the fact that Jesus has conquered these powers. There's a great passage. Read it in the second chapter of, of Colossians. Paul uses an image borrowed from his own time. When a Roman general uh, won a victory, he'd bring the uh, leaders of the captive nation back, and they, they, he'd parade them in chains through the street to humiliate them. Paul says, Christ through his cross has done just that with the dark powers. He's chained them up and has now made a public display of them, he says. You know, we read that language now, we think, what's he talking about? That's exactly what he's talking about, is what he would have known as a Roman citizen, a citizen of that world, is, oh yeah, they're humiliating these uh, conquered people. That's what Christ did through the power of the cross, which means... We don't have to be beholden to these powers. See, that's near the heart of the Christian thing. They've been defeated, and we now can claim victory over them. What are the weapons that we have, if you want to stay with that kind of military analogy? The Mass, the Eucharist, confession, the sacraments, the saints. In other words, the whole stuff of the church you might construe as the weapons that we can use in the battle against the dark powers. Here's one of the sad things. As Catholics now in droves stay away from all those weapons, they shouldn't be too surprised that the dark powers can begin to have an influence over them. Or switch the analogy now to the, a medical one, especially with confession in mind. Suppose you have a, a bad cut you know, on your hand, a deep cut, which you never attend to. You don't treat it. You don't bandage it in any way, no disinfectant applied. It's just this open wound. Well, what's going to happen is, is bacteria, germs, and so on will get in, and the hand will become infected. If you, if you ignore that, in time, your whole body will become infected, right? Think of sin. I don't mean trivial sin here, but I mean like that repeated habitual sin that, that we can all fall into as a kind of an open wound in your spirit. Untreated, what can happen is... The germs and bacteria, if you want, in the spiritual order, the dark powers can use that as a way of getting in, a way of influencing you. 
Well, see, what does the church give us? The means to treat these wounds. It's called confession. It's called the confession of our sins, the reception of absolution, which treats that wound, you know. Um, we have the weapons, we have the medical means, if you want, to deal with these powers, which have been defeated by Christ. But we have to claim um, that victory. We have to claim that healing. And I think that's right near the heart of the Christian thing to this day. As Jesus sent them out 2,000 years ago to do battle, he still sends a church out for the same purpose today.